Hi there. Today I wanted to talk about a provocative t a subject, a controversial subject, and the subject is money. And the reason why I say it's a provocative subject is because whenever the, sub the topic comes out, whether um, money and politics are the two topics that actually cause strong reactions in people. Anyway, welcome to my show and today it's going to be about money. Let's talk about money. Um, a lot of people, especially in the spiritual circles, they tend to avoid this subject, as do I. It's a subject I avoid um, because of, of the strong reaction that we can get from people, especially in this arena of spirituality, healing. And it, so it ends up being the elephant in the room that people avoid talking about. Um, unfortunately, people in this arena are also, in many cases, the ones who struggle to make money. And they shouldn't be struggling because we need more of you in the world. We don't want people who are working in the healing spirituality field to struggle because the world actually needs more of you. But from the letters I receive from people who have uh, watched my videos and listened, you know, listened to my podcasts or radio shows or who've read my books, um, the letters I receive, many of you say, that you are finding your purpose and you know that your purpose is um, something more than just working at a job, but you struggle financially. You want to be a healer, you want to be a teacher, you want to do these things, but you uh, are struggling financially. And so that's what I want to talk about today and I want to address that. And I just want to say hi to a couple of you who've posted. Hi, Shaf Garcia. It's always so lovely to see you and um, and I look forward to seeing you in, in Bristol in a couple of months. Hi, Roz. Love you bunches right back. Roz is my wonderful intrepid assistant who's always so supportive and always there for me. So thank you, Roz. Um, and Carly Small. Hi, Carly. It's so wonderful to see all of you on a Sunday tuning in live. Thank you. And here I am. It's like uh, I, I started late today. It's 12.09 Pacific. And here I am with my um, unicorn tea mug. <laughs> Which, in fact, the other beautiful person who supports me, Milena Joy Morris, she gifted me this, this mug, this unicorn mug, and I love it. So um, thank you, Milena, and if you're watching from somewhere today, hi. <laughs> um, so anyway, oh, Kristen Magdivis, hi from Denmark. Oh, thank you for tuning in all the way from Denmark. It's always really wonderful to have people tuning in from all over the world. And Moni Mamiko Ogura, hi, Mamiko. I finally got on your live show. Yay, I'm so happy you did. Mamiko, I think you've been helping us with some translations and things into Japanese. Thank you, Mamiko. And we have Petra from Croatia. Thanks, guys. So, um, the subject of money. <laughs> yes, Barbara Clark. I love the unicorn. Yes, so do I. <laughs> I love unicorns gen generally. So, Barbara, you and I are kindred souls. Um, so, I want to share a couple of stories from my own life to really to really share with you and I think you will relate to them to really get to the heart of the matter of why and how I think people especially empaths struggle with money one of the patterns I've noticed is that empaths are the ones who are struggling most with money and the reason is because empaths are the ones who are most attracted to work like healing work and um, spiritual work and spiritual teaching. They are most attracted to that kind of work and they are also the ones who are struggling with money because there is an innate belief that we shouldn't be charging for that kind of work. That's number one. And the second thing is because empaths love to help people, um, they attract a lot of people who need their help but who may not be able to pay them and empaths have trouble saying no. So empaths end up becoming snowed under with work and projects and things to do, but um, struggle with making money or being rewarded for the work they do. So when I, um, shortly after I had my own near-death experience and um, I was 
I was actually starting to live my life again. So for those of you who don't know my backstory, but I'm assuming most of you do, I had end stage cancer and uh, I had cancer for four years and I wasn't working during that time. And finally, when I had the NDE, the cancer healed, the NDE being the near-death experience, which was my experience on the other side. By the way, all of which I speak about in my book, Dying to Be Me, which is on special at the moment. So if you haven't read it, please read it, because in that I share a lot of my insights from the other side. Now, having so when I came back from the other side, I couldn't go back to a job that just paid money for the sake of money. My life felt like I had a much bigger purpose. I felt like there was a reason I had come back. And um, my reason was to help people in some way. And I knew that all I had to do was be myself, be authentic, be myself, and to be myself fearlessly, because that's what my dad said, who I encountered on the other side. My deceased father said to me, all you have to do is live your life fearlessly and be yourself. Those are the two main things he said, be yourself and live your life fearlessly and your purpose will unfold. So as I started to do that, after I came back, um, both Danny was as affected by what happened to me as I was, and he had lost his job while I was sick because we both thought I was dying and he stopped going into work. So now we were both starting afresh. We both didn't have work and we wanted to do something meaningful. In the interim, I started sharing my story online and I started helping people online. And I was invited to speak at a few medical conferences and things, but um, those medical conferences in the beginning were pretty good, but after a while, I didn't enjoy that so much because um, everything was towards a more medical slant and I wasn't able to express myself in the way I wanted to, which is how important it is to love yourself, value yourself, find your purpose and all these things. So I started sharing in this way online. So online I was, um, I was telling people about how important it was to love yourself and I had many people on forums and writing me emails as well as comments on forums who were asking me to help them because they were struggling. This was nothing to do with money at that time. It was struggling with finding their purpose and struggling with um, disease and illness. And so I was like sharing my take on everything, everything I learned on the other side. And I started to feel that, hey, this really feel this really feels like it's my purpose and by the way um Corinne Roquet thank you for your question a question popped up were you paid for medical conferences the answer is no at that point I wasn't being paid for anything that I was doing um so I was just sharing from my passion and the doctors who were inviting me just wanted me to share because they said it would help the medical doctors and the universities and the patients, but I wasn't getting paid anything. So anyway, um, I started um, contributing online to an online forum and I was attracting a lot of questions from people and I was answering all their questions. And then one day I had this idea that Maybe this is what I'm meant to do. And as I was communicating with people online, we were Skyping each other and we were talking about things of how to um, increase our energy. You know, I talk about this if you look at my Facebook Lives, the kind of things I talk about, how to increase our energy and how if we increase our energy, we can feel more well and it decreases our illness and all this kind of thing. So one day I had this idea that I actually want to do an event where people come and we can do it in person with each other. And so I went to um, a holistic healing center. This is where in the country where I lived at the time, which was Hong Kong. I went and asked the people there if I could rent a room, like a, a little venue. And uh, so I rented a room for a date a few months down the line, which, uh, would which would easily seat maybe 20 people, 25 people. And then 
I asked them if they would help me to send out an email to their email list, which they happily agreed to do. So I created an email telling people about my backstory and what I wanted to do during a one day workshop. And so this was my first attempt at trying to do something like this. And I created this email saying, and this is what I hoped to achieve. And it was just a little modest little event and the venue cost me money and I had to pay them in advance. And so, of course, I had to sell tickets for this event or sell seats. So um, I was feeling really good. I thought, oh, maybe this is my purpose because everybody on the forum is so happy. Everybody wants to talk to me. Everybody wants to Skype with me. They seem to be being helped. As this email, um, the venue sent out all these emails to everyone on their mailing list, I received an email from one lady. Um, I won't of course, say who it is. Um, she believed she was a well-wisher, but her email to me felt very scathing. In this email, she said to me that um, you are someone who received a gift from God. You shouldn't be charging for it. You are exploiting people because uh, you will attract people with cancer and they will be desperate and they will come to you because they have cancer and they want healing. Now, it was really like as an empath, these words really reverberated inside my head. It was like a knife cutting through me. And I felt, oh my God, that is the furthest thing from my mind. Exploiting people is like the furthest thing I ever want to do. All I was trying to do was sustain myself while trying to share this, the, what I learned from the other side, which I believed was helping people. And all I was trying to do was sustain myself um, because I knew that both Danny and I, we were now trying to start our lives afresh and we had to try and f also figure out how we were going to live and pay our rent and so on. So on the one hand, um, I knew I had to trust and know that everything is going to work out, that I'm going to be looked after. On the other hand, um, we knew that everything we had saved was dwindling because we had no income and we didn't want to go back to the corporate world because it just didn't feel like I had come back just to go and work again in a corporate job just to pay my bills. It just didn't feel right. So I was kind of feeling like I was backed into this corner. What do I do when I do the work I love and get paid for it? I'm being made to feel that I'm exploiting people. Um, but when I do the work I don't love, which is okay to be paid for, um, I feel that's not my purpose. Now, I want to hear from you in the comments, and I may not read them now, but I want to hear from you in the comments how many of you relate to exactly what I am saying right now. The fact that I want to do the work that I love but I feel I've, I'm being made to feel that I'm exploiting people if I get paid to do it. And I don't feel that I am here just to go to a soulless corporate job where it's okay to get paid. It's totally accepted to get paid. But it means I'm just going to a job just for the sake of getting paid to pay my bills. And so, um, and I felt my purpose was much bigger than that, as I feel is your purpose, by the way. This is not just about me. This is about you as well. Your purpose is much bigger than just to go to a job to get paid to pay the bills. So I would love to hear from you and I'll read them back later. How many of you relate to what I just said? So a couple of things I want to say here before I go on. Um, thank you. I, I hear from Denise that she totally relates. Yes, because this is the letter that I get. Jill Hammerin, totally relate. This is the letter that most people write to me. How can I sustain myself? Leela Bird, I relate. Thank you. Yes, that is exactly where I was. So, um, Here's the interesting thing, Lisa Zager, yes. So the interesting thing is the lady who wrote that to me, um, she was writing it from a place of where she was, she believed she was a well-wisher. She said, I just want the best for you. I hope you take it in the spirit. I mean it. What's interesting, and I'm not judging her for this, she was a high-flying corporate lawyer 
who earned, earned hundreds of dollars for every hour of her time. Uh, and she lived in a beautiful home in a beautiful mansion, whereas Danny and I were literally living from month to month, spending our time just helping people online and not getting paid for it. So that's the, so, so get, so I wanted to put that into proportion and I don't judge her for what she does or how much money she makes. I think it's fantastic. My point is I felt judged and I didn't see it at the time, but we have developed a culture that has really whacked out priorities where it is totally okay to work for the sake of making money and to have no other purpose except to make money. And in fact, it's totally okay in a corporate field that's soulless where you work just for money. And in fact, you're admired for more money you make. But yet when you're in a field where you are helping people, where you are teaching people, uh, and that includes even our teachers at schools, by the way, they don't get paid enough. But anyway, where you are helping people, teaching people, healing people, and it's frowned upon when you're supported financially so that you can keep doing what you're doing. So anyway, that was the dichotomy that I was facing. So as a result of that email and me feeling that, oh my God, I don't want to ever be perceived as exploiting people because that's the furthest thing from my mind, um, I started to look for a part-time corporate job. And speaking of exploiting people who are vulnerable and who have cancer, the thing that occurs to me as I speak is that very often I feel that our medical paradigm, our medical, our drug companies actually exploit us um, and make our, us take protocols or follow protocols that are damaging to our bodies just because we fear the disease or the illness that the medical community has labeled as being serious. Um, and whereas I was actually trying to alleviate people from their fear, I was working with people who were sick and alleviating their fear um, <clears throat> and developing a different, helping them to develop a different relationship with their body while not, while, while being responsible enough not to take them away from whatever their medical doctors were saying. <clears throat> and yet um, it was being pointed out to me that I could be exploiting people because they were being desperate. So again, how whacked out is that in our current belief system? But I bought into what this lady wrote to me and I actually stopped. I, I, um, I went to the healing center where I had rented the room and I canceled the venue. So I canceled um, the venue and I retracted, I canceled the event and I went back to just helping people online for free, but I took on a part-time corporate job to help sustain ourselves. But here's what ended up happening. Um, because I was working part-time, um, I would, every time that I was not doing what I loved, which was helping the people online and having the Skype sessions and talking about what I learned on the other side and helping people who are going through illness. Every time I was not doing that, which was in itself a big job, I was there doing the corporate job, earning money. Um, and, and Danny was also starting up a new business at that time. So we were both trying to focus on trying to also stay afloat and feed ourselves. And so whenever I wasn't able to help all the people that I was helping, I would feel guilty. And because I was doing it for free, I was attracting boatloads of people from all over the world. What ended up happening was I started to become really burnt out because either I was trying to help these boatloads of people online or I was working the corporate job trying to earn money just to, to stay afloat. So in other words, the corporate job was funding me to do what I really loved to do. And that is a crazy way to live. And I became totally burnt out. And before I go on, I just want to read this comment from Debbie Rittner. Uh, Debbie says, the well-wisher sounds like a woman being hostile to another woman. She was projecting her insecurities onto you. Yes, that's a really good point. And I think also she was projecting some of her outdated 
um, I guess, religious slash spiritual beliefs. Um, so she was projecting some of those onto me, believing that uh, money needs to stay, that money is not spiritual. And that's one of the things I want to get onto in a moment, because what I want to say here is that um, what ended up happening is I started to get burnt out, completely burned out, because I was either helping people for free or working at a corporate job to be able to earn money to stay afloat. And um, interestingly, even though we can judge her for having that view, there are a lot of people outside who feel that way. And I mean really a lot because I still get the odd comment every now and then from people who say that I shouldn't be making money from what I do. <clears throat> and again, and so I want to reiterate here that I'm not the only one who gets these comments because I get letters from so many of you who want to follow your purpose, who want to do spiritual work, but you, you struggle making money. And this is because the paradigm, the whacked out belief system we have is that it's okay to make money purely for the sake of money itself, but it's not okay to make money when you are doing something spiritual which is really whacked out because it then forces you to do things that are purely for the sake of money itself. And where I want to go with this is I want to show you that you can actually take your focus off of money, completely take your focus off of money and follow your heart and follow your spiritual beliefs and allow the money to come into you and be a channel for money to come into you and continue to help people and have enough for yourself. And the way, and that's what I want to talk to you about next, how to do that. And the way that, um, and, and the thing is, em for empaths, it's a double-edged sword. We are the ones most geared up to do it this way because we are the ones who want to help everybody on the planet. We want to help the starving and the poor and those who can't afford it. Uh, afford food or afford healing and we want to help them for free but in order to help them for free we need to open ourselves up to let money come to us empaths need it more than anyone else because empaths are grav they gravitate towards work that comes from the heart it's a given that they are going to give of themselves. They cannot survive in this world unless they are helping people. That is the thing about empaths. For an empath, helping people is like breathing oxygen. So empaths more than anyone need to be okay with earning money. They really need to be okay with earning money. They really need to know that if somebody criticizes them for earning money, it's not your issue. You really need to know that if you are an empath because your purpose on this world is to be a channel for energy, for money, things like that to flow through you because that is how we can change the world and how we can change the balance of, you know, because right now there is a disparity in the world. There is a lot of poverty and there is a lot of wealth. There are people who are starving and there is a lot of wealth. And the people who are holding on to the wealth, they're holding on to it because it comes from a place of fear. Greed is driven by fear of there not being enough to go around. Whereas an empath can't seem to hold on to their money because they want to help everybody. Um, so if, if money was allowed to flow to empaths more than those who live in the world of fear that there's not enough to go around, then we would have a more balanced world. So I want to tell you how it changed for me. And I'm getting some really great comments and I'm going to go back and, and, and read them. And there's one here from Rosa that says, I totally agree, Anita. Everyone should be paid for sharing their gifts. Absolutely. Um, uh, so with me, what happened is I was invited while I was struggling. I was burnt out, struggling. I was invited to a, um, a dinner event where there was a motivational speaker. Uh, his name is Lenny Ravitch, and this is in Hong Kong. I was invited to a dinner event, and it was a wonderful event, but the host of the event said to me 
that I have told the speaker about your near-death experience and what you experienced on the other side. And he would like to know more. So at dinner, would you be okay to sit next to him and chat with him about it? I said, yeah, of course, I would love to. So at the dinner, I started sharing with Lenny everything that happened in my NDE and how my dad on the other side said to me, go back and live your life fearlessly. And I came back and the cancer healed. And so he said to me, so have you? And I said, have you what? And he said, have you been living your life fearlessly? And I said, mostly. And he said, what do you mean mostly? Either you have or you haven't. And I said, well, um, one area that's really got me stuck, and that's the area of finances. I can't seem to be getting that together. Um, you know, um, I'm struggling with finances. I want to just follow my purpose. I want to just trust everything. But um, we're, we're really just living month to month. And I don't know how I'm going to pay the bills unless I take on a corporate job. But I feel I came back for a bigger purpose. So here's me telling him that. And then he goes, he actually says to me, your dad said to you to live your life fearlessly. And your dad said that you just trust, just trust. All you have to do is be yourself. Your cancer healed after you came back. I can't believe that you are allowing finances to bring that fear out again. I can't believe that you let that woman who wrote to you make you feel fearful and guilty. And this is what he said. He goes, fear and guilt were the two things that gave you cancer in the first place. That woman is from that very paradigm that you broke away from when you had the near-death experience. Being yourself means breaking away from that paradigm that we all live in, this world with the whacked out beliefs about money, the whacked out beliefs about spirituality, everything is all wrong. You are letting yourself go back to that. You can't do that. And that was when I was like, oh my God, yes, this is how it happens. This is why people who have incredible spiritual experiences find it so hard to stay in that experience. Because we live in a paradigm where the dominant belief goes completely counter to what we learn on the other side. And I realized, oh my God, I have to be a lot stronger than I thought in living in that state, that near-death experience state. My dad never let me down. The cancer completely healed. All I have to do is continue to trust and not let people take me back to that old way of thinking. And there's going to be many as I follow my path, as I keep being who I am, there's going to be many that's going to try and knock me down. And that was just, um, <clears throat> I mean, it, it was just a big awakening for me. So the next thing I did was there was this friend of mine, her name was Sunitha. And believe me, some time had passed now between the time I had canceled that event. So my friend who owns a healing, another friend who owns a healing center had been inviting me to come and speak for some time. And she had been saying, that um, I have people here who will pay to come and see you. Why don't you just accept it? Why don't you just accept it? And I said, no, I can't do that. I don't want people to think I'm exploiting them. Now, <clears throat> and she'd been trying to convince me for about a year. Now I went back to her and I said, Sunitha, I'm going to take up on your offer. I am going to go to your healing center. See, something had opened up in me. And here's one of the things that opened up in me. My purpose and what I was doing was far greater in value than any money. And when I say far greater in value, in that if I stop thinking of money as being important, me just sustaining myself to get that message out there was the most important thing. If I let myself drown in what was happening, I would have had to stop doing what I was doing and just go back to the corporate world. And this is the case for so many of you who have healing gifts and teaching gifts, the world is deprived of who you are when you don't allow yourself to sustain yourself from this gift. So Sunitha invites me, I go there and she puts out a flyer, 60, 70 people come, 
all of them pay for tickets. Um, and I'm getting paid an amount, which for me at that time was like, wow, just to speak for two, three hours to these people, I get this. Wow. It felt amazing. So then I'm there, I'm speaking to them and I realized, oh my God, this is what I'm meant to be doing. So bear in mind, because I'd canceled the previous event, this was the first official live event I was doing with an audience. And I was like, oh, this is it. This really is what I'm meant to be doing. And when I got that, when I got that deja vu feeling of from my near death experience, follow your heart, just share your gift, be authentic, be who you are and take whatever gifts the universe gives you. That's when you won't believe it. Literally the very next day after delivering that event, I got a letter from Hay House saying Wayne Dyer discovered my story on the internet and wants me to write a book which Hay House will publish. And I cried when I saw that. I thought, oh my God, this is the confirmation. This is the confirmation that this is what I'm meant to be doing. And Wayne Dyer then flew me to, um, to Pasadena. I was living in Hong Kong. I mean, that was such a thrill. He had me stand in front of an audience of 3,000 people. And I was so scared. I was so nervous. And Wayne said to me, go on, share your story. And I was like shaking. And he said, he said are you scared? And I said, yes. And he said, you've been dead and back. What have you got to be scared about? And I, said, I actually said to him, it's scarier standing up on stage in front of 3000 people than it is being dead, um, which is actually the truth to an extent. But, um, but the rest is history. Since that day, the rest is history. And um, my life has just unfolded in many, many ways. And this is why my message to empaths is please open up to what the world gives you. Please open yourself up. Empaths are really good at giving. They are terrible at receiving. Please be open to receiving because the world needs you to receive because <clears throat> empaths are like the channels for this world, for this paradigm, for this universe. Uh, empaths are the ones who receive and give. In fact, you give more than you receive and then you become drained and then you become sick, which is what happened to me. We can't have that. We need you to learn to receive so that you can be supported. I always tell empaths to receive and I always tell people, please support your empaths. <clears throat> Don't get angry at them for making money. Don't judge them for making money. Because here's the thing, we're living in a world where we turn a blind eye to mega big corporates who operate on greed, who even employ sweatshops, who hire advertisers to convince you you need their product when you don't. And we turn a blind eye to all of that because we have allowed this in our paradigm. That's what our paradigm is filled with. And then we judge our, our little healers and teachers and little one man businesses that are trying to make ends meet so that they can go out and do what they do. So that is a pretty whacked out belief. Um, I have created just a few bullet points just to help you. So if you are an empath who is struggling right now, I'm just going to read out a few bullet points I've created to help you to get from where you are now to where um, you want to be. So that, that's what I want to do. And the other thing I just want to say is one of the things that um, people sometimes say or write is that it's, every, it's all very well, everything you say, but how does it help the poor, starving people, um, like half the world or a part of the world or a percentage of our world are poor and starving and everything you say doesn't help them. How can the money reach them? So here's the thing. Um, the reason why there are poor and starving people, the reason why we are in a paradigm that is so unequal is because many of those countries that have the poor and starving people are run by governments and corporates who hoard money and corrupt people who don't allow the money to go where it's most needed. 
But the more empaths that make money and the more empaths that take on leadership positions, the more balance we will start to see in the world. Um, so basically, only when more empaths start to earn money and take positions of power will we see more financial equality in the world. Because empaths feel guilty if they live well while others are going hungry. They're the ones most likely to bring balance to the disparity that, that currently exists in our world. If only empaths had the courage to step into their power instead of relinquishing the power powers to others, only then will we really start to see equality in the world. Um, so I developed six points that, um, yes, thank you, Michelle Lerner Myers says, I am an empath and so tired of financial problems. It's exhausting. I know how you feel. I've been there. It is really exhausting. So I want you to allow yourself to receive. And these are the six points I've developed. <clears throat> Number one, recognize that you are an empath. And I'm going to post these later so you can see them. So number one, recognize that you are an empath and that you have these tendencies. You have the tendencies to give more than you receive, particularly more of your energy than you receive. So you have the tendency to go into negative energy. In other words, you give more without charging your batteries, without taking your, uh, without taking care of yourself. So number one is to recognize that tendency. Number two <clears throat> is to work on finding your purpose. So ask, you know, I want you to ask yourself, am I a healer? Am I a teacher? What makes me feel alive? What energizes me? So I want you to start honing in on your purpose and your purpose is really about being who you are. So even you can ask yourself, who am I? What makes me feel energized? What do I find myself doing for free without even thinking about it? So these are the questions I want you to ask yourself you, um, and start to discover what it is that you love to do with your time. Then the third thing is I want you to start telling yourself that, your perp that you are deserving and worthy of being supported. I want you to start even visualizing yourself being supported and love yourself enough to keep your energy recharged. You really need, so, that, so this is the third thing, you, to know that you are worthy and deserving of being supported and to love yourself enough to do things that keeps your energy recharged whatever that may be. And remember I told you last week in last week's video that what you see, your physical body, is only 20% of who you are. Your body is like the tip of an iceberg. There's still a whole huge part of you that you can't see, which is on, on the other side. It's beyond our five senses. Your intuition, your sixth sense is actually the bigger part of you. So taking care of yourself and loving yourself means acknowledging that whole you. And that 80% of you might have a purpose that's bigger than the 20% of you that you can see. So take care of all of you. Energize your, that 80% of you. Listen to it. Listen to your intuition. Love yourself enough to trust it. Trust your intuition <clears throat> more than some letter you get from someone telling you that you're exploiting people. <clears throat> I'm sorry. So that's number three, loving yourself and loving all yourself, including the 80% that's, you know, that you can't see. Number four, and this is an important one, <clears throat> know that there is an unlimited amount of money on this planet. It may not seem that way, but it, because you've been buying into a belief that money is finite and so you have to work hard to get it or that you have to get things before everyone else does. And so you learn to com compete and it makes you fear not having enough money. It, that's what drives the corporates to fear not having enough money. And that's what drives greed. This whole fear that there isn't enough to go around. Um, for empaths, it makes you feel guilty when you have money because you think there isn't enough to go around. You think that if I have money and if I'm living well and someone isn't, um, I'd better not do that. I feel guilty. 
And so you tend not to live well, thinking that because it's a finite amount of money, someone else will be living well. But actually, if only you knew, there is actually an infinite amount of money. And even, and I am not a, um, a finance person. I'm not versed in, in money and finance. So even if somebody who is versed in money and finance and says to me, no, it is finance, there are, uh, it is finite, there are checks and balance in place, you can't say there's an infinite amount of money. Well, let me tell you this for the sake of the listener. Even if it's a finite amount of money, it's a hell of a lot more than any number that you can come up in your head. It's a hell of a lot more than any glass ceiling that you can reach no matter how much money you earn. And I would rather you earn the money because I know you're going to help people once you realize that it's, there is an infinite number amount of money. When you know how to allow the money to flow through you and you know it's an infinite amount of money, when you know it's infinite, you don't hold on to it. It's very easy for you to help people. Um, and when you know it's infinite, you don't feel guilty for having it. You don't feel you having it deprives someone else from having it. So thinking this way is actually very helpful. And anyway, even if it's not infinite, but believe me, it is because <clears throat> money flows just like energy does. And, and it does get printed because why do you think inflation happens? Because there is so much, because more and more money just keeps coming into circulation. So anyway, I digress. But going back to point number four, knowing that there is an unlimited amount of money on this planet, um, so it actually helps you. So I want you to know that. And I want you to know that uh, discard beliefs like, um, money doesn't grow on trees, or if I make money, I'm exploiting people. You need to discard those beliefs, especially as an empath. You need to know that you helping people is a given. You're going to help people anyway. By the way, I believe that Bill Gates is an empath because he actually creates so many um, charities that where he donates money to. And he seems to get a lot of pleasure from doing that. I believe that a lot of people that make a lot of money are empaths and they're pretty quiet about where their money goes. So number five, think of yourself as a channel for money to flow through. Think about what you would spend it on and how you would help yourself as well as other people if money were flowing through you. And remember to take care of yourself so that you can keep being a channel that takes care of other people. So that's number five, and that's really important. And number six, the final one, is actually the trickiest part. And the trickiest part is that once you are thinking this way, once you can think that money is infinite, there's, it's not a finite amount, um, just because those corporates have it doesn't mean I won't get it. And once you are thinking, you realize you're a channel for money, once you, um, once you find your purpose, number six is stop thinking about money. That's the trickiest part. Stop thinking about money. Focus on your purpose. Focus on your purpose. And this is really important. So make your purpose the priority of your life. And then when the money comes in, just be grateful. This money is coming in to support you in your purpose. This money is just flowing in and it's flowing in to help you pay your bills so that you can keep following your purpose. As your purpose grows, more money will come in. But don't focus on making money. Focus on your purpose. And when I say focus on your purpose, it means allow your purpose to grow as big as it needs to. When you focus on money, fear sets in. It's like, oh, I won't have enough money to do this next thing. Oh, I won't. I better not focus on this thing. Uh, I better curb my ideas. I better make my ideas smaller because it's going to require more money. What you end up doing is you end up making yourself smaller. So once you truly get, I have a bigger purpose. 
I am a channel for money. I know I'm going to help people. Now, once you get all that, and I am going to allow the money to come in. I don't feel I exploit people. I'm good with money coming in because I'm going to help people. It's going to help change the balance in the world. Once you get that, stop thinking about the money. Um, and the more you just focus on the purpose, and I'm sorry if I'm repeating it, it's because I'm excited about it and because I feel there's so much in there that I want you to unpack and I want you to get it. That once you focus on the purpose and allow your purpose to grow, your money will grow to support you in supporting that purpose. The more you allow yourself to be that channel for money um, and just focus on growing the purpose, the more the money will just come. And believe me, it works because that's what's been happening in my life. Since Wayne discovered my story, I have just been focusing on getting my message out there, on hoping that we can change some of the paradigms in this world, some of the whacked out beliefs that run counter to you living productive, happy, healthy lives. And I have been helped so much. It is unbelievable. And I could not do it if I believed that all I was was this physical body. It's only happening because I know there is so much more to me. There is so much more and this body is just the iceberg. But it really is important for you to know there is so much more. Allow yourself to be the channel and um, also to just focus on your purpose and not the money. Everything I create today is because of the focus on what it is I want to get out there, what it is I want to share. Um, whether it is these Facebook lives, which I love doing it because it feels so, um, it, it feels so present. You know, it feels like I'm right here presenting to you and I love that. Or whether it's online events or whether it's my retreats where I take you on the journey and we get to feel this tangible energy together and I take you on this journey to get in touch with that 80% of you. All of it is with this purpose. And I've stopped worrying about the money because I know that even if people pay me to come to these events, that money is just going back to creating more and more. And, you know, it's, it helps me to create more free stuff as well. So because for me, um, it doesn't really matter where the money comes from or what I'm doing for free or what I'm doing that's paid. It doesn't make a difference because the purpose is what becomes the bigger thing for you. That's where um, I'm hoping that you will start to reach or touch on that, that place in your life. And if any of you, from those of you that relate to what I'm saying, those of you that, um, that relate and that uh, understand what I'm saying, that have found your purpose, or those of you that relate to any point of what I was saying, I would love to hear from you. I'd love to read your comments. After I finish this video, I'm going to go back and read the comments. Um, and I want to just really quickly acknowledge a few of you who are here now <clears throat> and to let you know that if you want to know more about me, more about my events, more about anything, um, I, my, um, my website is anitamorjani.com. And everything is on there. And so let me real quickly just read a couple of comments. Um, Nafi Khal, uh, she's doing this for free. Her videos on FB and YouTube are free. There is much on our website. I am assuming you're responding to somebody that's commented earlier. So I will, um, I will go back and read that comment amongst many others. And I'm actually really looking forward to it. <clears throat> And, uh, and keep commenting even after this video is ended because I promise you I do go back and read the comments. And your comments um, help me to also determine upcoming topics for, for live videos. And I have a comment from Jenny Hernandez. How is it that you always seem to pinpoint and discuss all of what I know is currently holding me back? So thankful for you. Oh, thank you for that. And I love hearing that because it is interesting how many people say that to me. So I want to say that money is a topic that is 
as I said, the elephant in the room. It's a topic that I often feel uncomfortable talking about because I know that even um, when I, whenever I bring it up, whenever I do it, <clears throat> even with the intention of helping people who are struggling to make money, invariably there will be one or two comments that, of people that will say that you should be doing your events for free. Um, you know, I would if I could. I promise you I would if I could. Unfortunately, venues charge money. People who help me charge money. Unfortunately, I don't like taking from people for free. And this is why I can't do events for free because I need people to support me and they turn up and the money shows up. To pay them, the money shows up. People who have money show up at these events and they show up so that I can continue to also do free stuff. All I really care about is just continuing to do what I do. Um, and I know that probably this topic that I've talked about, Danny is signaling to me that it's had one of the highest viewerships that I've ever had for any video live. So it does mean it's a subject that needs to be brought out into the open. It really does. And if people feel that these events should be free, then I do believe that people who head up corporations who have a lot of money should fund these events so that they can be free for those who can't afford them. So yeah, I'm very happy for these, the, the events to be free. Um, but at the moment we live in a, in a world where our relationship with money is so entrenched that if you don't have money, you can't even buy food to put on the table. At the same time, we have corporates who do, who work, who um, put money over and above everything else, including the air that we breathe. So where we have this kind of dichotomy, this paradigm where we have polar opposites. And by the way, I will be writing about this, or I have already written about this, what I'm speaking to you about in my new book, Sensitive is the New Strong, which is still like a good 10, 11 months away from being released. But um, uh, I, it does go into more detail about the new paradigm that we could create if we recognized that empathy and sensitivity is a strength. So anyway, I leave you with those thoughts. And again, very happy to read your comments. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you, everybody. Um, stay tuned next week. Bye.